So I would say that a path is a type of stage, um, but it's one that extends into your environment. And the nice thing about a path is that it, it's an invitation to dive into the environment deeper. Now, a path could be something that is leading you around, you know, the dimensions and, and into areas that you can't see yet. You know, you start to, as you see this path here, you start to kind of wonder what's even going behind that object, you know, in addition to what's inside it. Um, or it can be just something that leads off into nowhere. Like in this example, these are both examples from Todd Harris, but this path kind of leads us up into to nowhere. But, you know, it's intriguing. We want to follow and find out what's at the end of that path. It's just built in. We want to, to go find what's at the end. Um, this is Kevin Nelson. I don't remember who did that um, or who did this, but these are examples of this is a stronger path uh, but it's a river rather than a regular path right and a river kind of does the same thing you want to it pulls you back into the environment even though it's not a path that you would walk on um, suggestions of paths can also do the same thing so you know we just have this little arch and a pathway that goes back into it and that is enough to to get your mind going and you want to find out what's going on back there this one just kind of goes around a corner, same thing. And you can see that a lot of the things that we saw in the staging, the pulling down into the center of this staged area applies to the path as well, right? We're reinforcing the path the same way. So there's also uh, visual paths. So instead of having like an actual physical place that you can walk um, or a place that you would go on boat or whatever you can have, something that has shapes to it that lead you along. You know, this is going back to that idea of flow. So instead of just doing flow randomly, what you're doing is you're trying to reinforce the paths of your piece using uh, the flow and rhythms of your, your image. And let's see how that works there. Here's an example of some physical paths. I mean, it, none of it's really physical, but you know what I mean. So here's some paths that kind of lead us around here. And then we're drawn back by these visual paths that take us through these mountains, through the foreground again. You know, and because these paths are strong paths, even when there's a barrier there, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, we're, we're naturally drawn across this line to the, that really strong path up there. And it's interesting because it, it basically becomes another part of your, you know, we talked about value composition and how, you know, you can get people to jump across a certain area by making a higher contrast here and stuff like that. That's what's happening here, but it's actually lower contrast. But because that path is so strong in the background, our eye naturally wants to pull up there and explore it, right? So he's actually able to have one value composition, which is interestingly enough a path composition moving along here um, which kind of continues around in the front and then you've got a secondary composition of the paths themselves which is not part of the value composition and the two things kind of go against each other and it makes a very very visually interesting image so, Sam, is the, that's Bruce Zick by the way is, the, is like the only difference path and a vista, just the, the fact that the path is more linear? So a vista is more like, uh, I forgot who it was that said, maybe it was Andrew, was, was saying it's like an establishing shot. It's saying, here's something that might happen later, or here's something that might be important later, yeah. or this is helping give you context for this moment, or something like yeah. that, right? Whereas a path says, come with me, let's go explore together, right? Okay. That's the difference. So it's like Instead of a, a suggestion, it's an, it's an actual invitation. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's almost like the, the vista is more like an, an invitation to stick with the story. You know, it's like stick with us because there are cool things yet to come or something. I don't know that it's always used in that way, but, you know, that's it's a, a way to kind of pull you into the world and make you interested in the world, engaged in the world, whereas this actually makes you want to explore the world and see more of what's going on inside that 
specific thing. Now this one's interesting because there's a path that kind of just weaves through the piece. It starts at the top and ends at the bottom, or at the bottom and ends at the top. And it almost doesn't matter, but it, what it's doing here is uh, just adding interest. It, it keeps all of this kind of complicated rock coral thing um, unified and adds interest to it. So it's not always about pulling you into the piece further. Sometimes those visual paths can just move you around in the composition and that's enough. So a uh, tunnel is actually a really great, uh, is actually a really, really strong path. So how many paths do you see in that image? I think this is uh, Leighton Hickman, who does amazing work for films. Is this a trick question? Uh, no, no, th this is an actual question. How many paths do you see? One. Just like four of them. Okay, so if, if we're just following this, we could go up these stairs, right? We could potentially go around this corner and go up those stairs. Or we could go down here. It looks like there's some more stairs there. Or we could go down here and there's more stairs there. Just kidding. There's, there's more. Twelve. Yeah, so there, there's all sorts of paths in. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but which is the most important path? It's the tunnel by far, right? So we just there's something about tunnels and caves. We just can't help but we want to go in there, right? I don't know what it is. So, And especially added with like the uh, pigeons that are taking off in the golden, beautiful light, it just ends up being like, you should really, really go down this path. There's something great down there. And, you know, you almost don't care about those. It's like all the other stuff is really interesting, but it's like, oh, I'll go see that later. Honestly, it's at the end of this, right? <laughs> so paths can be uh, used in other interesting ways as well. This is Corey Loftus. Um, so the path in this image does not actually start in an area where we can get to it, right? There's a fence in the way. So what does that say to us? How does that Don't affect? Yeah, it, it's like even all the colors in the image almost make it a friendly place. Um, obviously, it's got the Gothic arches, which Gothic is bad, right? Not really, but um, at least the way that's being used in this case, it's kind of this creepy place. And it becomes a forbidden place by putting that fence right at the beginning of the path. It's like, and in some ways, that makes you want to hop that fence even more and go follow up the path, right? Probably depending on what personality you are. If you were like me as a kid, you're like, I'm never going to go there, Mom, I promise. <laughs> That's how I was. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about environment depth. If you want to see a great discussion on environment depth, I think if you go to um, Mark Kennedy's blog, some of these examples are pulled from there. He talks about, uh, talks about this more in depth. But the idea is that the type of perspective and the way that you are using the rules of perspective in your piece will affect how people respond to it. Um, and the style of your world is also going to affect. So some some stories are going to be mostly flat space with a, a, the occasional deep space thing, right? And occasional ambiguous space, whereas others are going to be all deep space with the occasional flat space when they want to create a funny moment or something like that. And we talked about this last time, how flat equals funny and deep equals depth, or deep e equals whatever it does. Drama. Drama, yeah, that's what it was. So um, same rules kind of apply here. But you can actually, you can put drama in a flat space environment. You can do it. But you've got to use other cues to, to do it. So with a flat space, basically you're getting as few dimensional cues as possible. You're just using overlap. You're maybe using a little bit of scalar distance. And you're using atmospheric perspective, at, at, you know, at the most. And so we're seeing in this scene, Bigger trees and smaller trees, so we get the, the scalar distance, the um, scalar perspective. We're also seeing uh, some atmospheric perspective, and then we see overlap. We know that this bush is in front of that tree back there, but everything else about it is kind of squished together, right? You get the feeling this is a, a very uh, tight view from a, a longer lens. 
same thing here. Lots of overlaps as are the cues for the depth in the world. Almost nothing else there. Almost nothing here to indicate space, only overlap. We know that that cliff is going back there because there's an overlap, and that's it. So you don't want to do a flat space thing if it is not uh, something that people are already familiar with. So if you're doing like a jungle, and it's a familiar jungle, flat space is totally fine. If you're doing a castle, flat space is fine. If you're doing an alien landscape, bad idea, right? Is it also like, depending on how much Most of our, I've noticed most of our environments are flat space, mm -hmm. just because that's easier to kind of gloss over and not yep. pay attention to as much. Yeah, I think it's it tends to not pull you back into the background. You know, like we talked about paths and how they draw you back and how vistas draw you back. Flat space has a tendency not to draw you back. It keeps you right there in the foreground. And if I were to pop out characters at different depths here, you know, someone's clear back here and someone's there. Um, you know, we can still get kind of a somewhat dramatic moment from that, but it's never really about the environment. It's almost like a puppet show or something, you know what I mean? That's not to say that this, yeah, you can do a lot with, like all of these have, have multiple applications to them, so I don't want to make it seem like you should never ever do something dramatic in this because Sleeping Beauty had moments of deep space and moments of flat space, and it worked really well, the juxtaposition. Um, and they just kind of alternated between and ended up being very dramatic overall. It, it was a, you know, less comedic and more dramatic out of the pantheon of Disney things. Um, and it worked really well. So limited space is kind of in between flat space and deep space where you're getting some dimensional cues, but you're still avoiding the kind of converging lines perspective that you learned in junior high, right? So we get a much stronger feeling of depth here. We don't get that kind of claustrophobic mashing together that we had with flat space. But, you know, it's still fairly ambiguous in parts. A lot more atmospheric perspective in that one. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of organizational design types of things that happen. It almost becomes like a graphic design in, in both um, limited space and flat space. You're, you're designing how things are working and interacting with each other in that graphic composition. Whereas when you move to deep space, you're using every spatial cue you possibly can and you're creating a sense of depth um, and it really gives you the sense of weight and drama. Um, even in this case, I think this is from Beauty and the Beast and you know it's got this beautiful palette. It feels idyllic, but there's, you get the feeling that there's some weight to this story and to this world, right? It's not all fun and games necessarily, and that was a good decision for that film. So ambiguous space is when you are throwing in things to confuse people so that they don't have a good sense of depth. So this goes one step further than the flat space and may actually use deep space and then change things up on you so that you think it's flat space and then change things up on you and think that it's deep space but now the deep space is going a different direction, right? And you can see great example here by Bruce Zick again where you're not really sure what paths you're supposed to walk on or what direction things are supposed to be coming from. I don't know if that was what he intended here but definitely gets an ambiguous space vibe to it. And this one from Sleeping Beauty, 